I'm going to make a note to mention Tulane. Oh, yeah. I'm going to forget if I don't write that down. <laughs> well, for it. It's always funny. I feel like in most of your episodes, somehow New Orleans gets thrown in. Yeah, you got to mention New Orleans, man. Like, you know how people from New Orleans are. There were several in a row I was listening to that like were unrelated to each other, and they all kept relating to New Orleans. And I was like, what is going on here? Whether it was like <laughs> Tulane food or something or like busy, I'm like, what is happening? That's, that's how we do. You know how we do. You live there for a while. Oh, yeah. I miss it. All right. Let's do it. Let's get it. <clears throat> What's up, UX fam? How's your mom and them? Welcome to another episode of Beyond UX Design. I'm Jeremy. If you're new here, welcome to the show. I am super stoked to have you. Before we jump into the normal stuff, I want to give a shout out to Peter for leaving some awesome feedback for the new book, Beyond UX Design, Master Your Craft Beyond Pixels and Prototypes. And don't forget, if you get the book from beyonduxdesign.com slash book, you can use the code listener to get 10% off your copy. Then leave some honest feedback. You'll get a chance to win a shout out on the show just like this. So head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash book. Use the code listener to get 10% off your copy today. This week's episode is brought to you by Jeff White and his UX storytelling toolkit. Now, lots of people talk about the importance of storytelling for UX designers, but Jeff brings actionable clarity to the concept and he shows you exactly how to do it. He breaks down different real world scenarios like how to use different storytelling methods to present your work to clients and stakeholders how to craft a better case study for your portfolio, and how to improve portfolio presentations for job interviews. I love Jeff's approach to storytelling here. It's not your simple once upon a time kind of stuff. And since you're an amazing listener, and I know that this course will help you out so much, I've partnered with Jeff to get everybody listening a 10% discount if you use the code BEYONDUX when you check out. So head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash storytelling and use the code BEYONDUX at checkout to get 10% off Jeff's storytelling course. So learn some incredible techniques to influence your team and advance your UX career. And if you haven't done it already, please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you are regular here and you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would really appreciate you leaving a five-star review. That'll help me out so much more than you can imagine. As always, thanks so much to Chris, Siraquan, Stacey, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, Kevin, and Jason for their support. And if you want to join these fine folks and many others and help keep the show independent and ad-free, you'll get rough transcripts and exclusive access to the entire video library of episodes, including episodes before they're released. And you can get instant access to the video archives for as little as $5 a month. And for more information on how you can support the show and help more people find out about what we're doing here, make sure to check out beyonduxdesign.com support. And of course, if you think the show is worth sharing, then I would love it if you told some friends. So I've got somebody I'm really excited to talk to today. One Frankie Kastenbaum. You may you may know her from LinkedIn fame. She's been a top voice not once but twice, which I'm actually really impressed by. By the way, I got to figure Thank out you. how to do that because I I'd love to get. I'm, I'm a little envious. I'll be perfectly honest. And I'm not talking about those silly AI article badges, top voice. I'm talking about the actual ones where humans nominate you when you get selected. So that's a pretty big deal. Not only that. Frankie is a, an alum from my alma mater, Tulane. We went through the same course back in the day. So we got a fellow uh, New Yorker that was a New Orleanian for a little while, and now she's back in New York City. So we got Frankie Kastenbaum, and I'm so excited to have her on the show today. We're going to talk about finding UX insights in your everyday life and in the mundane things that you, you don't really expect. Frankie is a senior UX designer who's passionate about breaking the barrier of entry for beginner UXers, and throughout her career, she has worked at a variety of companies and company environments from a startup, a design agency, and several corporate companies. She focuses a great deal of her time on mentoring upcoming designers through one-on-one sessions, as well as educational content on both Instagram and LinkedIn. And her efforts as a content creator has been recognized twice by LinkedIn, naming her a top voice in design, both for 2020 and for 2022. So Frankie, welcome to Beyond UX Design. I am so excited to have you on. How's it going? Thanks, Jeremy. I'm so excited to be here. It's going great. Super excited. Can't wait to get into this topic and get into Hell all yeah. that you just said. I love it. So a, a couple of things like I've, I've noticed with you on LinkedIn, I, I think this is really cool and and something I, I wanted to talk to you today about. You've had several posts where you, you talk about UX insights, things you've learned about UX design from just the sort of random everyday things. And I, I think that's really cool. And I want to talk about that. But before we get into all that stuff, Tell us a little bit about you, your background. I mentioned you went to Tulane, but, uh, you know, there's a lot more there than that. Although, you know, I am partial to the New Orleans <laughs> stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but tell us a little bit about you. How'd you get into UX design and, uh, and, and how'd you end up becoming a content creator? Yeah, sure. So for me, 
we'll come full circle, I promise. But basically, when I was younger in high school, basically thought I was going to become an engineer. That was kind of always the plan. Started learning to code front end and back end, kind of expected that was a game plan. As you said, I got to Tulane, um, realized my brain does not work that way. I am not mathematical. I'm definitely a design brain. So I got to college, realized I was not good at this and that I needed something that was more of a kind of work-life balance, going to be more fun and something I actually wanted to do. I ended up basically exploring a bit more. I wanted to find something that allowed me to really still solve problems like coding did, but do it from kind of a mindset that was more of design-based um, and more fun for me. So kind of through more exploring, I ultimately got into graph design for a little bit, um, but oh, cool. didn't really like how like there wasn't, at least for me, and I apologize to the graph designers out there, but for me, I felt like I didn't really have a reason for why I was making my design decisions in a, in, in a way that was comfortable and confident. You know, there's brand guides you follow and things like that, but it wasn't enough for me. You know, I ended up realizing like UX was that perfect kind of middle ground where it pulls it all together. It brought in the problem solving. It brought in, you know, the design piece, but it also had that research where I was really missing that. And so that's what led me afterwards to a boot camp, honestly. And then ever since in the UX space, kind of just going full step ahead, figuring out that kind of path for myself. You also mentioned the content piece. That was something I never thought I would get into, honestly. I'm as someone who like used to hate being behind the camera, hated hearing my own voice. It's kind of weird to see, oh, like that's what I do now. But basically when I first was breaking into UX, someone mentioned to me, like, I don't really care how you do it. Just get your voice and your opinion out there. You know, start a blog, start a podcast, start a this, start a that. I don't care. Was really hit the point. And so at that point, I started on Medium, figured, you know, that's my most comfortable way. I'll just start posting about kind of the, the passion projects I'm working on. And that ultimately led me to kind of going full steam, LinkedIn, Instagram, the whole nine yards. Um, and now, you know, doing it a little differently, less about the projects and more about like from a senior standpoint. But yeah, it kind of, I fell right into it, honestly. I love that. No, that's so cool. And, and one of the things that, like I said, I, I really found fascinating about your content on LinkedIn was a lot of the stuff that you post about, um, it, it's, it's finding, it's finding those UX insights and in sort of the everyday life. So I really want to talk about that. And one of the things that I'm curious about from your perspective is, you, you know, clearly you've got a lot of these analogies and I'm just wondering, you know, the, the I'm, I'm thinking about the value of a good analogy and kind of how, how it helps to kind of uh, get these people who are learning UX to kind of think about it and learn from personal experience. I'm curious from your perspective. I want to talk a little bit about just sort of the value that you found from a really good analogy. I know one thing I've always learned about kind of whether it's like teaching or helping someone is like, I've noticed that the way that it resonates the best, if you can connect with them. And I think that obviously that kind of comes in a lot of different images and in a lot of different pieces. But I think that's where I was getting these analogies and why it kind of led to them was the fact it's easier to explain something to someone if they can relate it to something else, especially for people who are outside of our industry. You know, UX is kind of a weird one to explain, especially if you don't go through the the steps of it and you're not in the, the, the actual industry yourself. It's kind of this like unknown box almost a little bit to a lot of individuals. And so I think that creating a, an analogy allows you to kind of connect that better because it allows you to kind of see, oh, OK, I understand X, Y, Z. So because I understand this, that makes understanding UX a little easier. So I think that was really what kind of led me to it and why I think it works. So I'm curious, a lot of these uh, things that you're talking about, these are these are lessons you've sort of learned. I'm, I'm curious, like, how, where do you go to find some of these lessons? Are you, do they just sort of come to you in the shower while you're doing a random thing? Or is it something you're like, you're trying to find so that you can make analogies to share those insights or how does that do is it maybe a little mix of both honestly it was not intentional at all it's usually just they come to me randomly in a weird way like i've heard a lot of quotes like i'm a big workout person um and i haven't hidden that on any of my like content so you've probably heard me talk about that a lot but basically during a lot of my classes i find those say quotes that just resonate with me that obviously they are saying in the sense of like getting you motivated getting you to like keep working out but in a weird way, and maybe it's because my brain is always thinking about like the UX kind of job search from that for the content piece, my mind always goes to that. I'm like, oh, this can make sense. So I think it's just that is like I hear things or I'm starting to think about something and I'm like, wait, this actually connects. So I think it's that problem of being a content creator and I don't know how to turn my brain off. 
that they always just kind of like (laughs) automatically come when I don't mean them to. That's so funny. I'm curious how you keep track of them. Do you have like a pen and paper? (laughs) Do you have like a favorite notebook? Do you like just, I don't know, take a audio thing? I'm just curious how you do that. I have an iPhone. (laughs) Honestly, I have a notes tab in my- uh, It's a magical tool. On my phone that I just kind of always put notes in. You would think it would be more organized. Um, It's kind of just random notes. And then what I end up actually doing is I have a Notion template for like a calendar that I end up using and like going in and actually like setting up, okay, like this is for LinkedIn, this is for Instagram, here's the different pieces. And then I can like actually put the post in those um, and go more in depth. But yeah, honestly, for the random ideas, it's just on my phone and my notes. So I'm, I'm curious like how you go about taking those things, like walk me through an example. Like I, you mentioned, uh, you, we, you and I had a call not long ago and you mentioned you or at the gym, you pinch your finger and you're like, oh, this is, a, I'm going to think, I'm trying to think of how to like, com- talk to me about, about that process. I want to, sure. <laughs> you don't have to share your secrets or anything, but I'm just curious how that works. Yeah, it was a weird one. That was a very, that was a bit of a stretch, but it, honestly, <laughs> I thought it worked really well, but it was kind of a weird mentality. So for those of you who didn't see that post, basically I was working out, had some weights, ended up getting my finger stuck between two weights. I'm fine. Don't worry. Little pain for, you know, a day or two. But basically, I started thinking about, and I don't really know how I got there, but I think it was more of this mentality, honestly, of like, wait, I need a post because I had been lacking a little bit. So I was like, okay, what can I connect that's every day? And so I started thinking about, okay, like, this is interesting. Like, the more I started thinking about things I was trying to do, I think I started typing on my computer or writing a text message. And I was like, wait a second, because I got, I think it was my, it was my thumb that I got stuck. So I was like, I actually use my thumb for so many things that you don't think about. And I was just getting so frustrated because anytime I was trying to do something, I couldn't do it or it hurt at least. And so I think it just got me thinking of like, okay, this is interesting. Like, I don't think about how much I use my thumb for everyday things. This is similar to, I think, maybe something that was going on with one of my projects where I was like, I don't really think about a lot of the small pieces and how important they are. And so it just kind of got me spinning and got me into this mentality of like, all right, there's a weird connection here. Like, let's see where this takes me. Um, (laughs) It just kind of went with it. So, and then is it like a a matter of refining it or do you ever go back and kind of test it with (laughs) with your audience or test it with some students or mentees or Mm -hmm. something? Like, does it make sense? You know, or or is it just, or you're just like, I'm going for it. I'm just going to do it. Throw it out there. See what happens. I'll usually write it um, and then I'll end up proofreading it, editing it a couple of times you know, messing around kind of on the phone or on Notion, and then I'll mm-hmm. just kind of post it. Um, maybe I should be A-B testing, sending it to mentees to, <laughs> you know, you know, I don't know, but I don't. I'm just like, you know what, let's just see it. I don't know. For me, I think that's kind of the fun part and the scary part of content of like, you know what, I like this, so I'm going to post it. I think that was the big thing, like transition for me. It was like, you know what, obviously I care what they think and I want like to get the engagement. I want it to be helpful. But I think it's also at the end of the day, it's like I've noticed like I want to, I'm going to post what I want to post. You know, I'm going to post what I think is important because there's a reason why I think it's important, whether if it's talked about or not. Um, And so I I don't know. Maybe it's the wrong mentality to have, but that's kind of where I'm at. No, I I actually believe the same thing. Like there's people all the time will be like, you know, oh, your posts are this or your posts are too long or you need to format them differently or talk about something that's trending. And I'm like, I don't want to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I just, I don't want to. I don't, it's not me. I'm not, I'm not doing that. If you don't like my posts, then, you know, I don't know, don't like them or whatever, but I'm not changing. Exactly. Plus like you can A-B test basically like as you go through them, like one day you do like one with a photo, one day you do one with text and just kind of see that way as well. But I don't know. So I'm, I'm curious, you, you've been posting for a long time, obviously you've got, you've been top voice on LinkedIn. And, and so you've, you've shared quite a bit of stories and not everything is an analogy, obviously, but I'm curious over the last couple of years, out of the things you shared, what have been some of the most interesting analogies that you have (laughs) shared that you feel like have resonated with people that really made it click for a lot of people? Because like you said, it is sort of a, can be very confusing for a lot of people, especially new designers that, that don't have a background in UX. What's some stuff that you've shared that you felt like really click with people? I think probably the analogy that probably made the most sense and kind of was the easiest to understand to like everyday audience, I guess you could say. I don't know. That felt weird. Um, Would be cooking. Yeah. Just because I feel like that's something, even if you're not a good cook, everyone has probably cooked at least once in their life. I'd like some sort. And so I think that's the one that's made the most sense because like if you think about cooking, for example, there's kind of three phases I like to think of it as. There's the first phase where let's pretend you're cooking for a friend, a spouse, a partner, something like that. You're cooking for someone else. And so I think first step is thinking about what are the ingredients that they don't like or they're allergic to. So thinking about from that mindset of like, okay, what can you not use? What is not going to make this user or your person you're cooking for unhappy? And I think that's the first step to think about. 
But then step number two is, okay, now that you've figured out what ingredients you're using, you're starting to cook, you start iterating. You start probably testing and, or tasting more so the different ingredients you've put together. Is it too salty? Is it too this? Does it need this? And you start tasting it, kind of trying to you know mold it together to get to a place you're happy with. And then the last step would be thinking about you know the the plating of it. Obviously, most of us are not professional cooks. We're not going to go all out, but at least you want to think about you know what's going to make it look appetizing. You know what's going to get your person who you're serving it to to actually want to eat this and make it look good. You know, I think that's the easiest part or the simplest layer more so of how you want to serve it. And so I think like that has resonated well with people because if you break those down into the UX, first step being what are the ingredients or what can you not use? Okay, that's basically doing some user testing. You're technically talking to your users. You're hearing feedback from them. You're getting to know what they like, what they don't like, what's not working. So that's phase one. Phase number two would be the you're tasting it. You're getting through and making sure that it actually works okay, you're iterating. You're going through different processes. You're trying different screens. You're seeing the flow that works, what doesn't, things like that. And then bucket number three is going to be the aesthetics. You know, for UX, you want the product that you're building to look good, whether it's to keep them engaged, to keep them, you know, coming back and wanting to use it to make it actually work. Does the flow work? Does it actually make sense? Um, And so I think that's the last bucket is, you know, the aesthetics and making sure that it actually pleases them. But I think that's the one that's worked well because it resonates because everyone knows how to cook and you break it down easily. Or everyone's eating a meal or everyone is. And that's the thing that I love about this because like when you think about software, building software, it's a really complex Mm -hmm. process. Generally speaking, there's a lot of words, big words, complex uh, concepts, things that are very confusing and can get very technical. And being able to, this is why I love this idea so much of just finding the insights in the everyday thing is, is it makes it much simpler to break it down. And that food analogy, I love that one. Actually, I had, I had Ann Cantera yeah. on not long ago, a couple months ago back, talking about her experience as a chef and how it translates so well to not even just UX, but just software development in yep. general, I think, you know, where, where you've got a front of house staff, a back of house staff, working in restaurants really is very similar in theory, at least the insights, uh, not in, in practice, obviously, but getting that concept across, it's a great analogy. I love that analogy. Yeah. I I'm like a big food foodie, obviously. Like I, I love food and I almost went to culinary school. So like, I, I'm a big, I love to cook. And I, I, that was like one of the first, uh, thinking about kind of analogies. One of the first things like I realized, like, I think like a very long time ago was that idea, like cooking, eating, meal pre- meal preparation, everything is like so similar mm-hmm. to the way we build really great software. I love that analogy. You had another one that was really good too about skiing. What, I know I asked you your favorites, but I'm, I'm putting that one out there, but I, I really like the skiing no, one. I thought I that was really skiing. good. I, I love to ski, so I can always talk about that. So, but oh, happy to do that. But yeah, skiing is another one that it was interesting where it's kind of a similar idea where with skiing, specifically, let's say you're going down like a mogul run. Um, And for those of you who don't ski, I'm talking about the nice little bumps on the mountain. And so basically, if you're trying to do that in like a more professional way, quote unquote, if you can't see me doing that, basically the whole idea is that you want to start at the top of the mountain and think about kind of finding your pathway at the very beginning, all the way from the top to the bottom before you even start. So that as you go, the whole idea with the moguls and going through them is when you're in the middle of one, you want to basically be thinking about how to get around the next one. So that you, you get your body in the right position so that you don't fall forward or backwards and basically fall over. That got me thinking about how it relates to UX because it's the same idea. With skiing, you want to think about, you know, the full flow basically from A to B or A to Z, I guess you could say. And the same with UX is that when you're designing something, you want to think about really how you can make sure that all flows your user is going to take is already thought about. And that your user is, is going to be content with going through kind of their happy paths. It's similar because you want to think about how when you're creating a, a feature, let's say, for a product, you want to make sure that when you ship it, that you probably have the full thing so that your user can end up doing the entire process all at once without getting frustrated and leaving the product. And so it's the same idea with skiing where you want to think about the full entire run from the start so that you don't get stuck in the middle and have to stop and then rethink about your path and figure out where you're going. So again, kind of a weird one, but it actually really connects. No, I love that. All right. So one of the things I'm, I'm kind of curious about is you've, you've talked to a ton of new designers and a lot of people, I think, you know, we mentioned about how like, you know, this idea, the very foreign, very, very, um, very, very foreign to a lot of people that are coming over. Some common misconceptions that you've seen that analogies have kind of helped to change that perspective. An interesting one. 
Hmm. I'm trying to think about that because, yeah, I think a lot of times with the conversations that I end up having with, especially with my mentees, is usually more so of like portfolio reviews and breaking in. And I think at that point, it's also more so about the fact of like they already seem to know what UX is, at least at the you know lowest level. So they already have ideas. And I think that's where the analogies help is more so for people who are a step behind them almost, where it's like they think they know they want to go into this, but they don't fully understand what it is or for people who just have zero idea. Um, I think that's more so where the, the analogies come in. Or maybe it's it helps my mentees in the sense that it helps them then relate to, you know, their families and explain what it is that they do in a better way. I don't know if it's necessarily helped with those conversations per se. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Because I'm, I'm kind of, I'm thinking about just some analogies. I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to like find an analogy right now. <laughs> but with portfolio reviews, no. I think there's an analogy there with how, especially now where these recruiters and hiring managers are just so overwhelmed and there's just sort of like, they're overflowing, you know, it's like you have a sort of funnel and you've got all the like water coming in or, or something in a funnel and if there's not enough room in the funnel and it's overflowing and how do you manage it all? I just think about, it's not really an analogy, but the, the thing I think about right now more than anything is like the episode of I Love Lucy from the 50s. I don't know if you remember that, but there was an episode where they worked in a in a candy, like a chocolate factory or something. And they were supposed to be like testing stuff and making sure like they were, you know, uh, passing only the good candy down the conveyor belt. And it got to the point, you know, they, they started off kind of slow and they're just sort of like, you know, moving the candy. And then they got to the point where it's just like, like hundreds and hundreds of like candy uh, chocolates are coming down the conveyor belt and they're like putting no, no, no. in their pants and they're like eating it and trying to, you know, like they're just so overwhelmed. And I feel like there's, I don't know, maybe this is an analogy necessarily, but there's sort of like a, I just think about that right now with like hiring managers and how to make like mm-hmm. your portfolio as easy for them to, to either accept or reject as possible so that they don't have to spend a lot of time like I Love Lucy. Did you ever watch that show? I don't know. That was before my time. Yeah. No, well, me too, I guess. I, I used to watch it on Nick at Night when I was a kid. But the only one, the thing that I'm thinking about, it, I think it was probably some spoof of what you're talking about, because this is clearly way more uh, my generation, I guess. But there was a Drake and Josh episode where they basically did that. Oh, yeah. They probably got it. Yeah, must sure have been like a play on it. And I didn't realize. <laughs> I thought it was like, oh, this is a funny idea. You know, yeah, everything, everything, everything comes back around. Oh, <laughs> there's yeah. no, there's no original idea. Which again is sort of like interesting when you think about that because like a lot of these things that I think like we can teach younger designers, they come from like other things, you know, it's like never really like an original thing. It's something that somebody else has thought of before and you're, you're manipulating or changing it in some way to tweak it slightly, you know? So anyway, that, that's also like, I don't know if that's an analogy, but that's (laughs) another interesting way to think about it. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's all about thinking about, again, this is where my UX mindset comes in, but I think it's always thinking about like who you're talking to and how it's going to resonate well with them. You know, thinking about how can you explain something in a way, knowing maybe a little bit about that person, how they think, how they, what they've done and using that information as a way to be like, oh yeah, this, you know, let's frame it this way. So then you know that, okay, there's more of a chance that this will resonate with this person than if you just kind of did it your generic way, maybe. I mean, there's too much thought going into my conversations. <laughs> All right. So here's something I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in hearing from you. So this happens to me a lot. I'm at a party, mm-hmm. a bunch of non-software people, non-technical people and, you know, or networking event or something. And, uh, you know, someone says, yeah, what do you do? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I generally, I'll just say something like software design or something because they everybody understands, like, I design the interfaces for the software. I don't I don't get too deep in it. But I'm curious, when, when you're at a party and someone asks that, is there an analogy that you like to use that, you know, a really quick thing to explain what you do to some random person who has absolutely no idea what software is or how, to, how software is built? Um, hmm. Putting you on the yeah, spot. that's always the dreaded question. <laughs> you know, I, I've definitely A-B tested this over the years and tried multiple different things, whether it's an analogy or it's like different definitions and things like that, just to kind of see what sticks. And like, obviously it's always different. I don't know. Now I just, I don't know if it's necessarily an analogy, but now I kind of just stay with like, I'm kind of the middle man between like uh, the users and the business and the developers. Like I'm kind of the step right before them or like I'm the designer before the developers. Um, which is like so basic, but it kind of works. But I guess in terms of like an analogy, now you got me curious and I'm going to, I want to test this next time. I don't know, maybe I'll try like a workout one or a cooking one next time. Cause I think those are the ones like everyone understands. So yeah, I'm going to test it out next time. 
<laughs> All right, try it out. Report back. We'll have we'll have to have a follow up episode and a, a, a design bite. I love it. <laughs> we'll just check in. Yeah, I, I actually like I like the restaurant one too, and I like the idea of a chef, you know, preparing a meal or whatever. It's kind of funny though. The thing I struggle with that analogy is like, where does UX fit in to that? And like, because like, are we the executive chefs? It's like I don't think we're the executive chefs. And then that begs the question: like, well, who is no. the ex- is it the product manager? Like, I hope not. You know, is it the CEO? Like, who who is the executive chef? But you know, anyway, uh, that's just, I, I think, thinking too deep Well, I think that's why it, you, you got to take it a step back for the cooking one. I think it's, that's why, like, I broke it down less about, like, being in, like, a professional setting for, like, a, a cooking setting and more so from, like, a, I'm going to cook dinner for a friend. Because then I think it's, like, easier. But I, you got me that's thinking. True. Now I am curious about, like, the professional aspect of, like, how do we, you know, elevate this, I guess, the next level. Yeah. But, yeah, I think... I almost feel like it would depend on who you ask as to like what level we would be, which is bad. Oh, everybody, everybody's going to, everyone's going to think that they're the executive chef. <laughs> exactly. You know, and always different, but I think also every org would be different depending on That's like true. where that UX kind of fits. That is um, and like true. how much. Not really power, but how much sway I guess they have. I don't know. I yeah. feel like that's a bad way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's true. But the, you know, the other analogy here too, though, is that like every restaurant's different as well. Right. Yes. So, you know, mm-hmm. there are restaurants where the executive chef is the commander in chief and, you know, everyone says, yes, chef, like salute, you know, and there's other restaurants where it's like to- totally flat. Everybody's got their own ideas and thoughts and can kind of add to it, you know, um, which is kind of interesting, yeah. too, because when you think about that, when you go to places like that, like because there's there's a place like, I don't you remember the PJ's coffee down in New Orleans. Right. You remember mm-hmm. PJ's. Of course. Mm-hmm. So yeah. PJ's has their franchise and a bunch of random people will own a bunch of PJ's. So this is a local coffee well, shop, anybody that's not aware. And the problem there is that they're all freaking different. Like yep. the menu's different. The coffee is really? different. The quality is different. Like there are some PJs that have amazing iced coffee, cold brew. And there are some where it tastes like garbage, you know? And I'm like, yep. I don't go to that PJs because their coffee's terrible, but I'll drive across town and go to the other one. And anyway, there's kind of like an analogy, I feel like there too, to how you're running, you know, the experience of a, of a user, right? And like how you have these disjointed you know, this is this one applies really, I think, to like something like service design, but where you've got a completely different experience because there yeah. are this these disjointed processes and there's no standard work. And, you know, obviously the way one shop makes their cold brew is clearly very different from another one. And so as a as a user, I go and I, I go to these experiences or I go to these places <laughs> expecting the same experience and I have a completely different experience because the 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 systems don't connect or the teams don't talk or whatever it is. So Anyway, that's that's an analogy I like to use for for something like service design. No, I like it. I think that's the other piece of that like we have to remember, especially like as juniors, that like UX is not just digital. Obviously, there's different umbrellas and it can change names. And there's different pieces in different sectors, but at the highest level, like there's a lot of different pieces. It's not just the digital experience. It's also like how do you get someone into your product? Kind of the step before the physical aspect of using it. And I think like those pieces are not always thought about. There's a lot more to it, basically. So one of the other interesting things, too, that I think about when it comes to analogies, we talked about, you know, helping new designers understand the concepts at a high level. But there's also this idea of, you know, transferable skills and things that people can bring to the table from a past career, right? Especially this is true, especially Mm -hmm. for career shifters. And I'm curious, how have you thought or have you thought about analogies for people who have done other things to help them think about those transferable skills and how they might apply to their new or future job as a UX designer. Is that, is that something you've ever thought about? Yes and no. I've definitely got, I've definitely had the conversation about thinking about kind of what are those transferable skills and, you know, what can you bring to the table that may not be the first thing you think about um, that would make, you know, the most sense. But now I'm curious how I done it with an analogy. Let's see. Hmm. It's usually it's just more of a conversation. Where it's like, okay, like what, what was the day to day? You know, tell me what you used to do. You know, I think fun ones for me that I've like got to thinking about was bartenders or like airline stewardess, because I think a lot of people wouldn't really associate the connection. But after those conversations, it's like, wait a second, like there's so much here in terms about like empathy and talking to users and helping them out. So I think it's, you know, thinking about putting yourself, and I don't know if this is necessarily an analogy, but like putting yourself in the shoes of what you used to do and thinking about, okay, like what is it? that I did, that inter- how did I interact with others, I guess. And I guess I'm kind of veering off and it's not really an analogy and I apologize. Um, I think it's more so that is just like thinking about what it is. 
And now I'm curious on the spot if I can come up with an analogy that would help with that because I'm very curious. Well, you know, here's something I just I don't I just thought about. I don't know if you've you've thought about it this way, but with the stewardess one, right? This is an interesting analogy because when you think about UX design, a lot of times people just assume like our job is to cater to the needs of a user, right? And just focus mm-hmm. on the user. Yeah. But you have to focus on the needs of the business so that the business makes money so they want to keep paying you, right? <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. So when you think about a stewardess or a flight attendant, they're not there to cater to the passenger's every whim. Yes, they will get you drinks and yes, they will get you snacks. But at the same time, they're there to make sure that everyone stays safe that you 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 board and deboard you know in a in a in a in an easy way a safe manner that when something happens they direct you to where you need to go so they can save your life and things like that and so like they're there to maintain you know law and order essentially <laughs> on with a friendly oh, yeah. smile uh, on the airplane and their main their main goal is to ensure a safe flight it's not to make you happy it's not to get you every single thing you asked for and there's a, certainly a balance there because they need to maintain the safety, but at the same time, they need to maintain a great experience so that you want to keep booking that airline over and over again, right? Mm-hmm. And so there right. is kind of sort of an interesting analogy there, I think, to how UX designers need to focus on users, but also understand the business and what the business is trying to do so that the customers want to pay, but at the same time, the, the business needs to make money. So anyway, I, I, that's kind of been, like, I haven't really thought about that much more, but there's, I think, an interesting analogy there between a flight attendant and how they would sort of mm-hmm. balance the needs of a u- needs of a of a guest passenger whatever you want to call it and the needs of the airline uh with you know users and and the business so i don't know that's kind of an issue i don't know if you ever thought about that but i just thought of that oh yeah there's a lot more behind the scenes that goes on with the flight attendants for sure that there's a lot of pieces that move around for sure and like we don't really see it or think about it but yeah i think it's it is interesting thing to think about kind of i want to know what analogy could be for that for like how do you satisfy or work in a position that's satisfying both the business and the users or the passengers, whoever we're talking about. I don't know. What's like a good analogy for like someone who's like the middle man? Okay, hold on. Let's see. Let's try this on the spot. I, All right, an idea came to mind. I don't know if it's going to work. Let's see. <laughs> we'll try so, it. We'll test it out. I don't know. I almost started to think about like if I was playing basketball, obviously okay. my mind goes to sports and to fitness. But if I go back to my basketball days, right? So if I was the one with the ball, let's say, I have two people on opposite ends. If I have the ball, I basically, my goal obviously is to pass the ball out. And I have a couple options, but let's say I only have two teammates up the the top of the court and that's where I'm going. So it's me and two other people. So one option is on my left maybe, and they're the business. And that if I go with them, you know, I'm going to satisfy the the business, I'll be go with them. But if I go to the right and I go to the other player who's on my right side, maybe that's the user and I'm going to satisfy them. And it's this idea of like, I'm stuck in the middle. I have the ball and I have two options to pass to, but who am I supposed to satisfy? Or maybe, maybe last second, a uh, third person comes up the middle and they can do a layup and get to, uh, in the middle of them both and get the ball in. Basically, that's the equivalent of like the middle option that satisfies both. Does that work? I think it works. <laughs> I have to be honest. I don't know anything about basketball. So I'm like maybe Fair. the worst person. <laughs> have a Pelicans fan? Come on. I mean, I'll, I'll watch the Pelicans. I had season tickets when it, when they were the Hornets uh, for like the right. 10 game thing. But yeah, I... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm terrible at basketball, by the way. Fine, we're not very good anyways. But no, I, I think I think this is an actually another interesting thing to think about with analogies is that sometimes analogies will work with one person and it'll completely fail with somebody oh, yeah. else. Because, you know, it, the the interesting thing is like, you know, we talk about storytelling and we talk about all that stuff. And, you know, it's sort of it's like kind of a buzzword storytelling and all that. But but really the point is to convey a, a message in an easy to digest what? way. That's really what we say, like storytelling. It's like, how do you get the message, yep. the point across? in as simplest language as possible. You know, we use symbolism, I think, is like a really great way to do that. And so the, the interesting thing with symbols, and this is, you know, again, why icons often fail, it's because what means something to one person means something yep. completely different to somebody else. So, you know, like the basketball analogy for me, like I don't really, I, I don't really know <laughs> basketball. So like, that, right. but you know, but at that that analogy yeah. would work really well with, you know, Trevor Nielsen who loves basketball and he would totally get it, right? So anyway, I don't know, that, but that's just, that's an interesting, I don't know, is that, a, is that an analogy about an analogy? I don't know. That, it's like I don't know, you're analogy now. inception. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, I don't know. That's just like an interesting takeaway though. But I think you did great. That was really mm-hmm. good. You did. Oh, yeah, that's why I like thinking about storytelling from like a conversation standpoint and like relating it that way. Of At the end of the day, all you're really trying to do by storytelling is have a conversation with someone and get it to a point where it's going to be something that makes sense to them and resonates with them. 
you know, at the end of the day, that's really all it is. And what it comes down to, like the most simplest level. No, that's a, that's a, a really great way to sort of close the conversation out. No, I, I think that's really good. Uh, so a c- question uh, for you, anything else that you want to talk about with analogies that we didn't cover? Anything we're missing? Anything you want other people to know when it comes to finding UX insights in the, in the everyday? Just think about what it is you love doing. Like forget about UX for a second. Like put that out the window. Don't try and think about it. Like don't try and connect it off the bat. Just think about for a few minutes, like what is it that you love doing? What are some of your hobbies? You know, do you love being crafty? Do you love the world is your oyster? The possibilities are endless. You know, think about what it is that you love to do when you're away from maybe your UX course, your UX job, whatever it is. Make a list of those things and then think about, okay, what are the skill sets or the concepts that are you're constantly doing for those pieces? Think outside the box. You know, don't think about the simple ones. You know, try and think outside the box. Think about, you know, what maybe might seem a little crazy because I feel like that's where the fun analogies usually come in. And then once you figure that out, be like, okay, let me now go down that list and kind of see, okay, what are the pieces that actually may connect to what I do as a day to day as a UXer? And I think that's where like the fun will come in. And that's where you'll start realizing, wait a second, there's so many random connections out there. Ones that Jeremy and I haven't even thought of because I'm sure there's plenty other ones that I'm going to start thinking about now. And trying to start to see what I can come up with. No, that's awesome. I love that. That is a, a great way to sum it up. Cool. So before we get yeah. out of here, um, I got some questions that I want to ask all my guests to help my my listeners get to know my guests a little bit better. But before we do that, tell us everybody, tell everybody listening where they can find you, follow you, all your content and all that stuff, and give yourself a little plug. Sure. Thanks. So you can find me mostly two places. LinkedIn, just Frankie Castabam. Pretty simple. Don't be afraid to connect with me there. Send me a message. I love chatting with all of you. And then the other place is on Instagram. My handle is UX by Frankie. Um, Also love posting there and love having conversations. So don't be a stranger. Feel free to connect. I always like uh, having conversations and talking to all of you. Right on. Are you still doing your newsletter? Yeah, it's Frankly UX. I am. Yeah. Okay. So I actually just posted my first article today of the year. Oh, nice. Um, But yeah, you can also find... Uh, content on my LinkedIn newsletter called It's uh, Frankly UX. I love that. It's Frankly UX. That's a brilliant, uh, a brilliant thing. All right, cool. So we got a few questions that I like to ask all my guests to help my listeners get to know uh, my guests a little bit better. Uh, yeah. You ready? You ready to get started? I'm ready. Let's do it. Five quick little things. Cool. All right. First up, what is your favorite non-design book? So I'm going to change the question a little bit. Oh, okay. Because I don't read non-design books these days as much okay. as it is. <laughs> Um, honestly, so I have a book club, a UX book yeah. club centered for kind of juniors. And so a lot of my time that I read or all of my time, I should say, is spent reading kind of designed UX focused books. So I'm going to pick one of those instead. Yeah, yeah go so for apologies it. for kind go of audible. Yeah, the we'll question. Yeah, go in audible. <laughs> but my favorite design book right now is Design is Storytelling by Ellen Lupton. It was one I actually had as a college book at Tulane for one of my courses. And it just kind of stuck with me. I've read it multiple times. I love it. Okay, cool. It's just really fun. It has a ton of pictures. There's a lot of analogies in it. And she just does a really good job of like connecting like this idea and this concept of like how to tell a story for kind of every day, but also for how you really design a project. It's an easy read. Highly recommend. I don't think I've ever heard of uh, design and storytelling. I have to look it up. Right on. I love that one. It's a good one. All right. What is your favorite non-design podcast? All right. I can actually follow this question. (laughs) (laughs) My favorite non-design podcast is How I Built This with Guy Raz. Yeah, I love that one. You heard of that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. I love that one. It's really interesting to see like a lot of the products or the apps that I use and just hear kind of the backstories of how they all started. Yeah, I um, I love that. That's such an interesting. I remember there was one, and it was the woman who started Spanx like forever ago. This okay. was like years mm-hmm. ago. Anyway, she was yeah. talking about how like she had in her garage and everything else, and like I don't know, it's just like really interesting, like how she started. I, 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 yeah. I same same for me. I, I love hearing about like all these like famous brands, and you're just like, wow, they just they re- literally did it that way. You know, it's really cool. The crazy one is Zappos. That was the first episode I remember listening to, and it like has stuck with me. Did you hear yeah. that one? I don't think I listened to that one. No. So basically, and I'll do it really shortly, but basically like this guy kind of started with this concept of, sh- of selling shoes mm-hmm. by having zero inventory and just oh, well, had okay. this concept of like, how do you kind of do it? And it was like super, I don't know, again, here's an analogy. Here's me going back to you, X, but it's the idea of the, oh my God, I'm forgetting the name of the term now. Oh, the Wizard of Oz. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's like the concept of the Wizard of Oz where like basically like you kind of fake it till you make it and kind of make it work, but it doesn't actually work. Yeah. It's all behind the scenes. So he basically had people place orders without physically having inventory and would then go to the shoe store and buy it. And then oh, he would wow. ship it. 
I don't think I realized that. Oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah, you know, speaking of Wizard of Oz, there's actually like a really a lot of really interesting UX research methods where you can like pretend to be a chat bot and it's like a human on the other mm-hmm. end or like, exactly. you know, yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff. It's just, or, or there's like, you know, it'll, it'll display some information when mm-hmm. they select a thing and that's all like, you know, auto, it's like not dynamic. You think it's dynamic, but it's right. just some random static thing that someone's manually doing in the background. But anyway, that's fascinating. I never thought to like apply it to a business. That would scare the hell right? out of me. I'd be like, oh my God. I, I like people order like stickers and stuff and I was just like, it takes me like weeks to get to the post office. <laughs> Just imagine, like, I would, my business would fail if that would matter. Yeah, well, uh, no. All right. What is your favorite meal? Mm, this is a tough one for me. I love food. Clearly, by all my food analogies. Mm. Probably something along the lines of, well, actually, well, these days we'll go with pad thai, honestly. I love a good peanut sauce. Mm, nice. Yeah, and, and you're in New York City, so you've got, like, the, probably the best, <laughs> the best Thai food outside of Thailand, I'm sure. Um, within walking distance. Although here. honestly, like I love making my own peanut sauce. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, right on. You know, what? Only from scratch. You know, Asian food for me growing up is like a Westerner. Like I'm used to, you know, Italian. My grand my grandma was Italian and German, and so like I grew up with like European style dishes, and that's what I grew up mm. learning how to cook. And so like trying to experiment with Asian stuff, South Asian, Indian, you know, Vietnamese, Thai, Chinese, Japanese, like. Like, it's so, love eating it, but, like, I don't know how to cook it, you know? It's just, like, really weird. Fair. So, like, mm-hmm. I got a lot of cookbooks and stuff. The thing is, you know, with Western-style cooking, like, I could just, like, throw stuff together, and I'm like, oh, it tastes great. But I don't know how to improvise <laughs> with, <laughs> with, like, okay, Asian fair. food. Yeah, I'm going to be opposite in a weird way. Yeah? I feel more comfortable improvising with more, like, the Asian, like, sauces and things than more so with maybe, like, uh, other cuisines. Really? Per se. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I, I need yeah, to, uh, I guess it's just like a matter of practice. It's just like, you know, getting, and also yeah. part of the problem is like a lot of the ingredients are hard to come by, you know, in a, in a Western grocery Fair. store, you know? <laughs> so they have like the international aisle that's like, you know, two things from like yeah. one country, two things, you know, but anyway, I don't know, but that's cool. I, I love, uh, I love a good pad thai. All right. What is your favorite vacation spot? Hmm. Either a beach or the mountain. Beach like I said, I, I love to ski. So these days it's probably going to a mountain and you have skiing. a favorite, a favorite mountain? Um, or a favorite beach or a favorite mountain by a beach? Favorite mountain is, well, my parents are in Colorado right now. So I'd say out there, right. out west. Is there, uh, are there like, I guess there's like, well, there's the, the Rockies, obviously, the mountain range, but are there, like, is there a specific mountain that people will go to for like skiing or is it just like a range? I guess doesn't really have a mountain. I guess it does, does a mountain have to be a certain yeah. size to get a name? <laughs> How does that work? I don't even know. <laughs> Uh, I should know this question and or the answer and I don't know it. Um, I feel like I should yeah. know that. I don't lot of, know it. I feel like there's yeah. got to be some something there. I feel like yes. Yeah. I'm going to go with yes. Um, but I, I mean, it depends. Like there's obviously there's different mountains. It just really depends like kind of where you are, I guess, in that area. Uh, like my parents have four mountains around them that are like for skiing, like for specific oh, skiing. Oh, wow, nice. Yeah. Like, you know, like Pikes Peak, I think is in the Rockies. That's in Colorado, right? So you've got like, one mountain, but there's clearly a range of many mountains. Like, how does that, how did Pikes Peak get its name and all the other one next to it didn't? I don't know. Is it the size? Is it the height? I wonder. I have to look that up. I'm like really interested now. Seems- Maybe the conditions and like people started going down it or don't. I, honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. Well, we'll have to Google this and get I, back to all of you. I'm going <laughs> to, after we get off, the first thing I'm going to do, how does a mountain get a name? All right. What is your favorite design tool uh, that yeah. is not Figma? So I feel like I'm going to get a lot of, um, Comments and uh, pushback on this one. I'm a big Canva user. Canva. Uh-oh. I love Canva. So obviously I do a lot of content. Um, and for me, a lot of the stuff is kind of like on the go or like the whole idea is like I have a brand. I want to be consistent. And I used to do it all in sketch when I was before Figma. I know. Um, but I actually switched <laughs> to Canva because now, <laughs> now I can do it. Like it's all like on the web. I can kind of do it on the go whether I'm on my phone or on the web browser. And it's just so easy. The designers out there, I know. I don't use any templates. I've made my own template. But it's just like an easy, quick browser. You can kind of drag and drop and do what you want. But I know I'm going to get pushback. Oh, no, it's cool. I actually have never really used Canva, to be honest. But do you? Uh, is it free? Or do you need a paid subscription to use it? There's both. There, there's a free If version? you okay. want... So there's a free one that has plenty, plenty of templates, honestly, for like all types of stuff. Um, And like you can just 
do what you need. Or if you want to have more of like your brand style saved and like your fonts and everything and more custom, then you have to pay. Then you got to pay. Okay. Yeah. But you can get put away easily with, you know, so much. Yeah. yeah. Just with the free one. Uh, speaking of, of sketch, I actually, it's funny. My old job, like we couldn't use Figma because of security stuff because of the, the server thing, mm. you know, and the browser based Anything. server thing. So we had, to, we were on sketch for years and they're still using sketch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no I know, the, I know the pain of sketch. It's uh, trying to have multiple people use one sketch file is a goddamn nightmare, which oh, is yeah. why Figma, which is why Figma is, is amazing, but cool. Yeah. I love it. I won't, I won't fault you for Canva. Don't worry. Uh, Thank you. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, well, that's everything for us. Uh, Frankie, I, I really appreciate you coming on before we get out of here. One more time, give yourself a plug. Where can everybody find you? Uh, and, and make sure you follow Frankie. Yeah. Thanks. So again, it's on LinkedIn. Frankie Kastenbaum, pretty simple, or on Instagram at UX by Frankie. Um, hope to see you on both right of them. On. Cool. Well, all right, y'all. That's it for Frankie and me for today. I hope we helped to shed a little bit of light on the power of analogies and metaphors when learning, especially things like UX design and software and the product lifecycle. All that can sometimes be a total mess depending on how you're approaching learning. But how have analogies and metaphors helped you? Do you use them often at work to help your team understand your thought process? Or have they helped you learn something you might have had a hard time learning otherwise? Let me know what you think on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at hello at beyonduxdesign.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. If you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would love it if you left a five-star review. That'll help me out so much more than you know. And if you know somebody who might find any of this stuff useful, then why don't you tell them about it? That would be fantastic. One more shout out to Peter for leaving some fantastic feedback for Beyond UX Design, Master Your Craft, Beyond Pixels and Prototypes. Don't forget if you pick up your copy from beyonduxdesign.com slash book and you leave some honest feedback, you'll get a chance to win a shout out on the show just like this. So head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash book, use the promo code listener and get 10% off your copy today. Help keep the show independent and ad free. Check out beyonduxdesign.com slash support to find out how. You can join Chris, Siroquan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, Kevin, Jason, and many others and help keep the show independent and ad-free. And if you do that, you'll get some rough transcripts and exclusive access to the entire video library of episodes, even episodes before they're released. And you get instant access to the video archives for as little as $5 a month. Do yourself a favor and head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash storytelling and use the promo code beyonduX at checkout to get 10% off Jeff's storytelling course to learn some super valuable ways to influence your team and advance your UX career. Remember to sign up for the newsletter and check out all the past episodes along with all the show notes at beyonduxdesign.com. I hope you keep coming back for more great UX tips from Beyond UX Design. And until next time, remember you're more than a designer because there's more to UX and design. I'll see you around. Take care, y'all.